Good day, fellow bronies. I am PycoPie, and I'll be your host for this Everfree Northwest writing track pre-con panel on plot. Everfree Northwest is, of course, the premier con for My Little Pony fan fiction. It takes place over the July 4th weekend at the Seattle Airport Hilton Hotel and Conference Center. You can find more at everfreenorthwest.com. We have a fantastic panel with us today, uh, including some award-winning guests lined up for you, so feel free to write your questions into the chat as we go along, and we will get to them towards the end of the broadcast, or as the questions come up, depending on the question. Returning from last month's panel on setting is the Brony fandom's most followed author, Penstrokes. Penstroke, tell, Penstroke, tell us about yourself. First, there's no plural, you know that. I'm dyslexic. Just like getting me to talk about it. Um, well, as Paco said, I'm the most followed author on uh, filmfiction.net. Uh, my writing credits include Past Sins, Better Living, Creeping Darkness into the Depths, Drop a Moonshine, da -da 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 -da, about a dozen stories in total. And um, yeah, that's like that's my that tends to be my resume and what uh, and most anyone needs to recognize who I am, at least in the fandom, if they know any, if they care to pay attention to fan fiction. Okay. Um, we also have Gary Oak, who recently won the Meadowlarks Award in Fiction from his Vancouver Island University, which I understand is their most prestigious award uh, for their authors. So, Gary, tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. As Pico alluded to, I am fortunate enough to be able to call myself an award-winning writing major. Oddly enough, my pony work is partly responsible for this. My journey to university began about a year after MLP inspired me to write a book-length fanfiction, Repercussions. Since then, I have handed in pony stories and pony spec scripts for classes with fantastic results, and I wrote a story that I ended up successfully showing to the protagonist's voice actors from the series. I absolutely love my epics, which my pony novel is, but my main strengths at the moment are comedy and technical writing. I'm currently working on my second book, which is non-pony, and I'm under Pico's employ for the YouTube channel Literature Pie, where I gave a series of writing lectures. Awesome. Um, and joining us in a few minutes will be a brony writer who won the um, Everfree Northwest uh, pre-con uh, writing contest um, with his, he was the only maniac fic and it was awesome. Um, so we'll have him join in here in a few minutes. He's having some minor technical difficulties. Um, but let's jump right into it. Um, plot, simply put, is what happens in the story. But it's a lot more than that. Um, from the opening action to the climax and the close, it's what drives the narrative forward. And um, what we want to do today is we want to talk extensively on how to craft a plot that keeps the audience, audience interested. And we'll cover things like plot plot twists, possibly some telegraphing, and the uh, narrative arc. So I think probably the best way to start out with this is for each of us to talk about our different writing styles. And seeing as Penstroke is the big writer on campus, let's. I think we should start with... I try to sneak away. Try to um, squeak away. Yeah, really, this chair, I'm sorry. This chair. Oh my God, this chair. It's like I can do a perfect creaky old person on a porch. Oh or God, do that, do. That but um, I am probably someone that a full literary, literary major like Gary Oak despises because I don't do a lot of proto, follow a lot of form and function when it comes to my writings on the plot, or writings in general. But um, generally, the way I tend to approach plot is I have the points in the story that come to mind fairly early. They're the big moments. They're the things that kind of need to happen for the story to take its original path. And um, it's like I will kind of see the course that needs to be taken roughly to get to those, and then I will start writing. But at the same time, if the plot starts to, like, if something I wove a little earlier starts to develop and something, oh, that would be cool. Or, the, oh, that's suddenly a plot twist that was preempted early without me even realizing it, which is sometimes what happens when uh, just brought in by the settings and characters that you're incorporating with the plot. Then I am generally take the freedom to explore those other plot directions. Huh. Uh, and how about you, uh, Gary, since uh, Penstroke led you in with the... Uh... <laughs> 
with thee being a professional writing major? Well, there is actually only one solid law in writing, and that's if it works, it works. So <laughs> that's actually true. Like, that's what one of my profs just writes all the time on the chalkboard. But anyway, it, it's kind of a bit of a mix between planned and in the moment. So sometimes I have this one idea and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to write a story about that. And this is, and then I just sort of develop outward from that. Sometimes they say, I want to go from here to here. This is what I want to accomplish. Da, 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 and then I just write. And a, a, some seat of your pants stuff will come out. And then I just sort of throw it in. I use that kind of as a basis for the rewrite, I guess. Cool. Um, and it looks like we have Brony Raider. Are you, uh, are you there and ready to give your uh, little intro about yourself? Yes. Awesome. Hey. Go ahead. Well, uh, I guess I shouldn't go with the uh, smartest answer I put on the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the little master document. Um, yeah, go ahead, speak up. It's okay. You can wing it if you want. I mean, you are a Pegasus, or I guess your picture there is an alicorn on our our little uh, stream. I'll be judging you. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, everyone's gonna be judging here. Uh, but that uh, that alicorn. I suppose I'll be talking about him, her later. Um, yeah. I'm uh, from. In Colorado. I've been doing this for uh, come next month, uh, two years. It's been my second anniversary of Pony. I've been in the fandom a little longer than that. I joined, uh, I think, mid season two. Like when I caught up, the next episode they came out was the Cranky Doodle episode. Uh, it was a good I hit episode. It big with. Huh? It was a good episode. It was. It, it was a great song. It was the best song in the series so far, but the episode was it was decent. Um, yeah, I hit it big with uh, the misadventures of a human named TD, and uh, uh, my stories about a serial killer rarity aren't so bad either. Uh, uh, yeah, I write comedy and grimdark, and generally whatever else strikes my fantasy, but Normally comedy, I found. Uh, it's what does it. So, I don't know. Anything else you want to know? <laughs> no, I think that's a good enough intro. Um, we're talking about our different right. uh, writing styles, like how we approach plot. And um, so I'll, I'll finish up here, and then I'll let you have a go at it. Um, I'm kind of weird how I approach plot. I see there as different ways. Um, the big thing I'm kind of like trying to research and I can't find anything on it right now is a uh, character driven plot. Um, basically a lot of people see it as drama, but to me, drama is like when, when you talk about drama, you talk about people having, you know, issues with each other. Penstrokes, you're an evil villain. Penstroke, you're an evil villain. Don't hurt me. Um, so for me, I've found that my most successful stories are, are best when I'm writing character-driven plot, where I might have an idea of where I'm going, but the, char but the way the characters interact ends up going a different direction. And um, that's something that I, I you see some writers do, and sometimes you don't. And you see a lot of writers that are very, like, I, I need this to happen and this to happen and this to happen, and it, it's not as natural. So um, my my big view on plot is that it, it should be a little bit more natural um, when it starts feeling forced and you start ha having to use awkward plot devices to get things moving. It, it doesn't make for as good of a story. That cat is having the time of its life. I'm sorry. I don't oh my to gosh. Distract. I don't mean to distract, but he's on my lap. I, um. I love cats and I'm allergic to them, so this is the best way for me to do them. <laughs> um... So, uh, Burning Raider, how about you tell us a little bit about how you approach your plots? I completely wing it. And I know that's that may sound strange, but um... oh no, no, no! You missed you missed Gary Oak's answer earlier. Of, of, if it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know how many of you have seen. Uh, I think it was Monty Python's Meaning of Life. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. um, just just after the uh, get the bucket scene, um, when 
yeah, it was Meaning of Life when Eric Idle's waiter says, all right, um, if you want to know the meaning of life, come on this way, this way, come on this way, just this way. Um, and the camera keeps following, completely following Eric Idle's lead. That's generally how I uh, approach my plots. Um, I'll write a chapter down, and then the story's like, okay, we're going to go here now. And I'm like, okay, I have no control. <laughs> I just listen to what my plot tells me to say uh, and write it down. And Do you find that you tend to have more short stories rather than long epics? Uh, um, I, I pepper my long epics with little short stories. Um, so I'll focus a lot on uh, long epics. So TD the Alicorn Princess, which is my current cover pictures fan art from that story uh, is just about to become my longest story at 150,000 words and not even close to done. But just so I don't get bored, I'll, um, you know, start writing other stories uh, just in the middle of that. So, um, you know, The Secret of Rarity is 150,000 words. Uh, Life of an Abroni is uh, really long. But in the middle of that, I'll write a story like Adoption, which is just 3,000 words, I think. Or, you know, Fair Broken enough. Gladiator, which was, you know, for the contest. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's break into some of the different um, mechanics that we use with plot. Um, I know... One that I always misunderstood where it came from. I thought the term deus ex machina, uh, which I know I'm mispronouncing, but I'm terrible at pronunciation. I used to think that came from the uh, video game. And, um, which tells me <laughs> I'm terrible with words and remembering where stuff is. So I'm like, oh, it probably came from the video game, right? I'm like, oh, no, it's like naming Darth Vader Darth Vader like it. It's foreshadowing. No, no. Never played that game the whole way through either. Ter terrible. I'm terrible at this. Wait, no. Deus Ex Machina is not... I don't. I wouldn't call that related to Darth Vader's being named Darth Vader. Uh, no, with the video game being called Deus Ex. Oh. Okay. So it kind of, kind of foreshadowed, too, which is another uh, tool that we'll probably be talking about here. And actually, let's talk about foreshadowing. Um, it's I like, lead in. Thank you for the tangent. <laughs> yes, I really like foreshadowing. I like it as a reader and I like it as a writer, but I find that sometimes I put it into my writing and then like, so I'll come up with a chapter and like chapter two, like here's some foreshadowing, but I don't want it to be like too obvious and I don't want to be it uh, to uh, be too hidden either. And I'll put it in and then like two chapters later, the thing happened and I'm like, oh, did anyone get it? Did anyone get it? And then no one comments on it. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> and you never know. Uh, yeah. That's one of the reasons why pre-readers are good. It's like, oh, yeah, I like how you did this. You're like, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's what rewrites yeah. are for. Ooh. That's why I never, ever publish anything that's first draft. Because there's little things you can always fix and make better and make work out of nowhere. I, I think he's trying to show the rest of us up. Yeah. What? I think he's trying to show the rest of us up. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Gary? Or what do I do? Yeah. Oh. It's like, I find foreshadowing works best when it's something that's built upon. It's like you drop the little clue earlier, but then you drop the next one, then you drop the next one, all leading to one particular thing. It's like the Hansel and Gretel dropping gr breadcrumbs. Because if you just foreshadow something once, someone may not notice it, or they may not realize it's important. But if you keep referencing thing or something related to that or something then it starts to build a chain that uh, that more people are going to know in my opinion and i think that probably applies a little bit more to uh fan fiction um i tend to see a lot of uh of newer 
readers and newer authors. I mean, if you look at the statistics for film fiction, like you'll notice like all these people who are making stories are in their twenties or thirties, some are in their in the late teens, but a lot of the users for filmfiction.net um are teens. And when you're writing to different levels of audience like different experience levels with reading and writing especially given the disappointing public school system we have um at least in america bro, uh gary oak had, i don't know is might have an easier time up in canada but i know uh, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> yes no well, to put it this way i've had to deal with people in third year university writing workshops who can't write a sentence properly i had to like correct like 20 comma splices in one short story i'm like really what Oh. <laughs> Come on. That is something I had to learn. I learned more from writing uh, on film fiction than I did um, uh, in any of my English classes. Not to say I didn't learn anything in my English classes, but I learned way more on film well, fiction. Sometimes it sometimes it's a matter of when you put it into practice, you're going to learn it, learn it better because you probably mm -hmm. learned about the comma splices and the this and that during the English class, but because you used it maybe for one worksheet and then just meh, then exactly. it's, it's like... I had the ultimate worksheet. The first draft of Repercussions was 108,000 words long. That was a 108,000 word English worksheet that I had to do. It took me a year, but I did it. But yeah, no, it's like, um, yeah, it's just like my day job is programming. And um, <laughs> it's like the past four or five years, I've been working largely in C Sharp. But recent, like just Friday, I had to jump back into C++. And it's like I took classes and I once knew C++ really well, beginning of my uh, university days. I just said that with too much of a pause now. I'm thinking of that fan fiction. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I just thought the same thing. But um, Final Octavia. it's like I do not remember. It's like I knew I knew it at one point, but I am just like remembering some of the basics, like how to do the command line is terrible because it's just like I haven't used it in five years. Yeah, and um, keeping up on remembering what the terms are for stuff is kind of half the problem with writing. Like, you might know how to do something, but you because you use called. it for school all the time, but then you don't get any time with teachers or editors, really. It's just you, and you might see something here or there. And you, Like, I know for me, usually it's uh, it was writing papers. It wasn't writing stories. So when I got in the Pony Fan Fiction, there was a lot of, like, using Wikipedia and, and re-looking up what terms are and how they're used and where they came from and making sure that I had a proper understanding. And sometimes what I'd remember would be a little bit off. Um, but with foreshadowing, um, there's also, I, I think Penn made a good point in that there's uh, uh, a point where you want to have foreshadowing but not do too much. I probably use foreshadowing too little because I'll I'll include a lot of foreshadowing, but it'll be like one, maybe two things for each thing that's upcoming. And then what ends up happening is that people miss it, as I said. So um, I know uh, that there was a comment um, made by, I think I'm mispronouncing it, B. Chandler 2. And that's what, what are the do's and don'ts of foreshadowing. And I would definitely say knowing your audience and you're having a specific target audience like if it's kids or teens you might want to use more foreshadowing i mean for a, a higher level reading level of a book um you might use it a little bit more not sparingly but each point might not be foreshadowed quite as much because i mean one of the nice things about foreshadowing is that you're getting a feeling of what's happening, but you won't know the specifics. So um, I know in early film, one of the things that they would do, because uh, they didn't have access to CGI or anything like that, is they would have the camera uh, pan with a, uh, uh, a light in between the main char the character that's about to die and the camera. And so you got this thing where suddenly like they're, they're shadowed out. And nowadays that would be seen as poor camera um, control a little bit more. I'm, I'm not using the correct terms again. Cinematography? Yes, sure. Um, but nowadays it would be seen as a poor use of the camera and the set. Whereas back in the day, they took that and they used it to their advantage. So suddenly like you'd feel a little bit awkward. You'd, you'd be like, why, why is this person keep you know, getting blocked out and stuff. And then, you know, something happened and they would die. And so you'd be led in with emotion. And part of the thing about 
foreshadowing is that you want to lead in with how you want the the reader to to feel you don't mm -hmm. necessarily want them to know exactly what's going to happen because for a lot of people that makes for a rather boring story and that's kind of the difference between when you're writing to a less experienced readership to more experience is that more experience they've seen more stories they've read more books it's easier for them to predict but uh kids and teens and people who maybe they didn't get reading into reading till they're later or they've never really been much of a reader they won't see that so knowing your target audience determines what are a lot of the do's and don'ts of foreshadowing um, um i would mm -hmm. add to that in the regards of um some of the do's and don'ts to foreshadowing can be related to um just how big of the event you want it to be yes in particular it's like if there's going to be a big event if like you're trying to foreshadow the big plot twist well like for example the evil genius pushes the button to doom the world or whatever um then there's going to be setup and it's like the more profound the event generally the more profound the foreshadowing is going to be because it's such a big thing so if you're going for a subtle reveal like for example um the uh the um the rom the romantic the previously not stated outright romantic relationship between two characters maybe it's just the fact that they tend to whisper to one another in certain situations or the other, one like makes the other laugh a lot it's like things that are subtle can lead to subtle but if you're going for something that's going to be a big foreshadow reveal and don't want the readers to feel like they're being blindsided by it you kind of have to make the foreshadowing a little bit more obvious a little bit more blunt mm-hmm and, and as, as you said about the different levels of writing and all that, um, a lot of us bronies watching the Pony episodes can see the, you know, the twist at the end coming after the first five minutes, like within the first act. And that's um, because it's written for younger people in a lot of cases. Best example of that is probably uh, find uh, Rainbow Dash pet episode. I forget what it's called. Exactly. Find yeah. Pet. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's stuff like that. Um, one example I wanted to point out of really amazing foreshadowing. Have any of you guys seen Reboot? It's like a 1994 yes. CGI. Oh, yes, I know Reboot. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how uh, in the second movie, like the last episode of the show, they revealed like how Megabyte ended up surviving the web because he ended up crushing Glitch, Glitch at the end of season two, which was, you know, years and years and years ago, and he got some of Bob's code? That was really cool because, like, oh, here's a little throwaway event that we thought we had significance for something else, you know, a key tool being broken, ended up having a lot of significance later on at the very end of the series. Mm-hmm. So you can, that's one thing about foreshadowing. You can make the audience think something has significance for X reason, but all of a sudden it has Y reason, but that Y reason also makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, and um, one th one thing that uh, B Chandler 2 brought up is that, so we're going more for the mood than the specific event. For foreshadowing, a lot of it, it is. And part of it is that you want the reader to know um to feel in the know. So if they feel like they've figured something out and they're close, then they uh, feel rewarded. They feel rewarded for being invested in the story. Um, and so what ends up happening is a lot of times you have um, foreshadowing that's very nonspecific. Like, you know something bad is going to happen, but you don't know what it is. And it could be any number of things. A main or a side character could die. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that kind of mood setting um, is a big um, part of I've it. Actually, I've actually got an example from one of the stories I wrote uh, is um, Wise Beyond Her Years. It's like the whole story is kind of pointing at Zakora for something in the foreshadowing, but it's never really stated outright what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But um, Brony Rider, do you have something? Do you, do you have insight to give to this topic? Yes. <laughs> that dramatic pause. Go ahead. <laughs> Jump in. No, I, uh, yeah. Uh, I found sometimes that foreshadowing uh, can be a lot of fun. Uh, there's this story I'm working on called Jackie, in which Sweetie Belle gets an imaginary friend uh, that might not be so imaginary. Uh, oh, creepy. Yep. yep. It's a lot of fun, and I and I, and since the story's not over yet, uh, and I hope to finish it soon soonish, uh, I won't spoil what I'm foreshadowing. But there's certainly a big plot twist that I am foreshadowing, 
and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I've also found that um, we've we've been talking about uh, and horror and plot twists. Uh, I found that comedy can also be foreshadowed like a joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, people tend to ignore that. Um, and I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, and that's and that's, and that's uh, bumming me out because it's because <laughs> well, it's something it's that a lot like, of people don't think like about. The, the trope we all know is like for um, for comedy is there's a banana peel on the ground. Yeah, mm-hmm. like if, someone's gonna slip on that banana peel. Exactly, it's it's foreshadowing. It's like exactly what happens when that banana peel gets slipped on, or what happens when someone doesn't slip on that banana peel can be a can be foreshadowing, and that actually brings up a subject of foreshadowing we can go look at if we want. Is oh. the idea of kind of reversing what you're foreshadowing for one reason or another. Oh, I have an example. Um, have any of you read the story uh, Scootaloo Dies a Bunch? Or heard of it? No. I've heard of it. No. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, actually, and I'd suggest it. Um, basically, you, it's it's kind of like South Park, uh, Kenny, but uh, the author goes through every single episode of the series, and Scootaloo dies in increasingly ridiculous ways, and it's kind of an in-joke with the Crusaders, and they're all exasperated by it, and Scootaloo keeps trying to figure out ways, okay, how do I not die? And uh, in the episode uh, Return of Harmony, the Discord episodes, uh, so the chapters for that, Scootaloo gets lost in the maze and talks to Discord. And Discord uh, just starts randomly, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly, but he like throws an anvil up in the air. And uh, the chapter continues. And then, naturally, uh, Scootle gets crushed by the anvil. And that's how she dies for that chapter, uh, for that arc. But then in Lesson Zero... You keep thinking that Scootle is going to be like trampled uh, or otherwise killed by Twilight, but then she gets hit by the anvil again, and it's just this: the anvil being thrown up in the air foreshadows. Yes, that's how Scootle is going to be, you know, crushed by it. So, yeah, I guess that goes back to your banana peel mm-hmm. point, but yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things you you want to be uh, the the as a author you can play with is um, using foreshadowing so that your readers don't get too caught off guard. So I know Fifth Man Writer asked about subplots, and so this kind of can kind of work on, on that. So if you have this big uh, arc for a huge story going on, you're 100,000 words in, and you want the romance not to work out for whatever reason, you can use foreshadowing to work into that so that it's not like, because I've, I've seen this in anime all the time. Build up, build up, build up. They're going to end up with this character. They're going to end up with this character. Eh, I'm going to go with that one for absolutely, like, no reason that, like, is made apparent in comparison to the other characters that there's a romantic interest in. And so when you're when you're using, affecting the mood of the reader, um, especially with uh, things like subplot, um, you can have... Uh, you can ease your reader into it so that they're not put off by the change. Because you see it a lot where something people don't feel is going to happen and it makes them feel like the story is wrong. And I've seen it, unfortunately, where people will rewrite what is otherwise a good ending because their fans do not like it because Um. they didn't lead the fans into it. And so foreshadowing is really good at um, preventing problems now on the one hand you get a lot of comments but you'll also get a lot of downvotes yeah i got a couple of points to add to that um the story that i'm working on which is in pony is actually like a really big amount of foreshadowing to this one final event that's actually the whole reason why the story takes place so it's pretty much pure foreshadowing even though the reader doesn't quite know it and making having it all make sense at the end is really difficult and one tip about rewriting is like one of the reasons why you rewrite is so you can foreshadow correctly because 
sometimes you're like, I want this event to happen in chapter 20 of the story. This actually happened to me. And then I was like, but I have to like lead into it somehow. And then you have to go back and rewrite from chapter one to make it all work together. And that's the merit of revising and redrafting before you post anything to FinFic. Yeah. And it's, it's like sometimes, and it's like sometimes, um, especially if you're doing the more sea of your pants writing, mm -hmm. you can kind of foreshadow things that you don't intend and they turn into awesome things later. Yep. Oh my gosh, I do that all the time, especially because I make up all of my stories as I go along, especially the epics. But it's like oh, um, I'm having that currently a bit in the story that's still in progress for me from the depths, just with something I introduced early on, as I knew it was going to be something that I needed to foreshadow for earlier, and I wanted to incorporate it, but at the same time I didn't know exactly how it was going to fit in it the whole time. Yeah, that's why, uh, I don't know, that's why I don't consider outlines gospel. They're really helpful, but that's why I like the mix yeah. of outline and I hate moment. outlines. <laughs> they have their place, but again, they're, they're not Some they're of them have gospel. their place, but I've... It's like, if you're going to do a I don't... time travel fic, you might want an outline. Yeah, you might. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Uh, you, you run into some problems there, but I don't think... I don't think I've ever written an outline, and I think if I had, I don't think I would ever followed it um because you know my, what's going to happen right why, why write something when you already know it's going to happen that, i'd like to be just as surprised by uh this where the story goes as other people do um yeah, no it's like that that can be sometimes the thing that kills me for writing is if i start to get ahead with my planning too much i start to lose motivation it's like oh i already know what i'm gonna have on just don't write crime fiction because crime fiction is yes. like outline 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 one of my professors actually has like all these little cards, like little index cards with uh, like one color is like a plot element, one's like a character, and she just spreads them out over like a big floor when she writes like a crime story. It's pretty insane. Yeah, that sounds boring. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. It. I, I, I've often surprised myself with where I go with a story, for better or for worse, and I've created whole new characters by just letting the story go where it wants to and I follow along like an owner uh, being pulled by a giant dog on a leash like uh, I doubt any of you have read my killer rarity stories but the character of Blossom, Sweetie Belle's daughter that was completely on the fly I just know that was not intentional at all like, the, the entire series is going to end with the scene when uh, Sweetie Belle was standing over Twilight with the knife, wondering whether or not to kill her. And I was like, I can end the whole series there. And I'm like, ah, no, I'd be stupid. And I'm like, where to then? Oh, she gets a daughter. Okay. And that's and it continued from there. And, and then I'm like, okay, I'll just end it with the second book still. And I'm like, no, okay. I guess I gotta write a third book about the daughter, Blossom, whose name I didn't think of until I was sitting there and Sweetie Belle was saying, her name is... And I was like, uh, what is her name going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay, this. All right, that sounds symbolic enough. Joyous Blossom, there you go. All right, that sounds Powerpuff good. Powerpuff Girls reference, there you go. Is it? Yeah. Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup. Yeah, that's, that wasn't a... Uh, I like uh, Bullet. To me, it was like a happy birth. So that's joy, joyous, joyful, blossom, new life blooming. Well, that's when, where I got that. When when you have a writing that that's a little bit more like you're writing it as you go along, um, you, <laughs> uh, cattails. Uh, you tend to have uh more, um tricks up your sleeve because people will start reading into things like you might be wanting to go one way and you decide not to um I, I, this is, applies i guess more to middle ground where you kind of have kind of have an idea where you want your plot to go but you're still writing it as you go along um and you tend to throw out a little bit more red herrings so things that people don't um they might think is important and then it's not and you might have a little bit of an unreliable narrator but sometimes with some writing styles that ends up being really cool you uh, tend to have a lot more investment in, is this going to happen? Like, what's going to happen? Like, you start generating, pe making people who like your story think about what's going to happen. 
And when they start doing that, they're more invested in the story. So now they're getting more out of it and they're enjoying it more. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And it kind of becomes this weird game between the author and the reader where they're trying to figure out what's going on and then they're not always correct and sometimes they're kind of correct and sometimes they're spot on. And mm -hmm. it, it's a really interesting interaction and you, and you can purposely write it in. You see that a little bit with the Game of Thrones but at the same time, um, you have to not to to keep it live, to keep it feeling like it's always like that. You have to kind of be unreliable yourself and following your own plot. Because like with the Game of Thrones, you start off like you don't actually know what's going to happen, and then by the a couple books in, you might not know exactly what's going to happen. But because of the author's writing style and the past history of how they wrote, you will be able to figure out. You know, which ones are the red herrings? You'll be able to figure out uh, some of the plot twists that are coming up, whether something's a Chekhov's gun or not, which means whether it's something that's that's mentioned because later it's important, like a chandelier that someone will then later swing from. Um, and so not having things completely planned out is good in a lot of ways. And you see a lot of people writing the full plot and following it, and it starts off with really good ideas, but then people kind of lose interest because it's very obvious where they're going they they you know whether it's foreshadowing a little bit too much or just the style that they write oh i cannot tell you how often i've had readers go oh this looks important or oh this character is gonna die or oh something bad is going to happen or blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. because <clears throat> i know brony writer this is how brony writer does things I've, i have that happen all the time and it's hilarious <laughs> and are they correct <laughs> i love it and, uh, uh often no um <laughs> i just recently had that where um uh the character who's my avatar uh princess antares who's the alicorn princess version of td um she has a birthday and a las pegasus uh representative comes to her birthday party and says, hey, uh, I have something very important to talk to you about. And then the other three princesses, uh, Antares, Celestia, and Luna all go to Las Pegasus. And my readers were like, ooh, this Las Pegasus representative had something important to talk to her about. And now they're all going to Las Pegasus. They're going to run into that, aren't they? Mm, I know Brody Rider. That's how he works. No, that's actually not what happened. That, mm -hmm. So... Uh, Penn, you had something yeah, to say? Off wrong. Yeah, um, something to <laughs> cell phone boring today. Um, I, will, I will now turn that down. But um, <laughs> the thing I was going to mention is sometimes when it comes to foreshadowing, a good good thing you can do is if you hit, some, you hit something heavy early, then kind of stop paying attention to it. And someone will, when you bring it back to preferences, it's like, oh, yeah. Every, all this other cool stuff had happened. I've forgotten about that. But oh yeah, I thought that was something important back then. But then it didn't happen. It's like okay, we must not have been. Oh, it was important. Mm -hmm. With with that dramatic actions, yes. Yeah, and that definitely helps the reader feel like like they would have known about it if they had remembered it. And so then they want to pay more attention so that they catch stuff like that in the future. And uh, Gary, did you have something to add as well? Uh. I basically said my piece on that. The next thing I want to talk about is like basically the, I guess the core of what a plot is. Yeah. If that's okay. Um, I yeah, I think off. we've chewed the fat on foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah no, we've right. kind of annihilated that one. Or are we foreshadowing that we're going to talk about foreshadowing more? Mm, red herring. Uh, oh yeah. god. I, uh, <laughs> no, the, the first thing I wanted to mention was uh, Freytag's pyramid. It's basically. Is if it's a plot, it will fit somewhere on the uh, Freytag's pyramid. The, the Freytag's pyramid starts with exposition, and then it goes with rising action, then climax at the top, and then falling action, and then which is the ending or resolution. And pretty much every story can fit on that. Uh, there should be a Wikipedia image. I'm not sure if we can get that up or not, but I'm looking right now. But yeah, and then it's like yeah, um, it's like. I've seen other diagrams that basically are a construction of the pyramid of multiple pyramids where it's like, what up, what up, uh, more roller, more roller coaster than 
yep. than a single pyramid, but it's like each individual segment can be seen as a, pic, uh, as a pyramid where there's some rise, a climax, some fall, even mm -hmm. if it is daisy chaining into another one. That's kind of like what a movie script looks like. Each act kind of is a Freytag's pyramid in of itself, and then you've got three of them kind of sandwiched together, and then you've got a film. Mm -hmm. um, I actually like really jittery plots, like where you might think that something is climaxing. Yeah, um, and then it, it starts to calm down, and then something else brings up a point, and it, it, it tends to work with me a lot more into drama. Um, but the, the story I'm writing right now is uh, Pinky's surprise, surprise, party, party, where um, in it, it's, it's a romance between AJ and Rainbow Dash, and it's kind of like after they're already together, and then this, this problem happens, and it Applejack has these feelings, and then Rainbow Dash is confused about what happened, and it's not even between them, it's something else, it's just their opinions on it, and so they're like, okay, let's deal with this later, we're at a party, it's okay, we can deal with it, and then something else brings it up to the point, and so you kind of have this um, uh, feeling of, the intent is to have a little bit of a feeling of a frustration by playing with the, uh, what uh, rising action and falling action um, make people kind of guess what's going to happen. And I think you see that a little bit more in dramas and uh, possibly uh, romance than you do in a lot of stories like Epic Adventures. Yeah, Epic Adventures generally, have fit, even if they have some jitter to them, will generally fit on an overarching scale the pyramid because it's like everything is kind of building up to that one big climax. It's like it's mm -hmm. the highest point. And then everything, it tends to really fall off hard after that. Yeah, and you want a big mm -hmm. emotional climax for a lot of those. It's like the moment Celestia is stabbed. Or it's like the moment where a, a, a figure that's previously been hidden or been in the background finally reveals their face. Or it's like it, that, it's just, it's like dawn, dawn, dawn. <laughs> like it, it, it's the kind of moment that particular musical stem was written for. Pretty much. For those struggling about plot, um, there's five or six questions you can actually ask yourself, and if you can answer all of these questions, it'll actually really help you just write a story if you're struggling. Uh, they're called the five W's and a D. Who is your protagonist? What do they want? Why do they want it? How do they go about getting it? Who or what gets in their way? And do they get it? How does how does how fit as a W? I have no idea. Ask the, my professor. That's what he told me. Because uh, it ends with a W. I guess. Uh -huh. I guess yeah. That does not work for me. I, I find the name of these rules, these questions invalid. But still, please continue. <laughs> also, I think the word changed from its initial use um, over hundreds of years. Like they replaced oh, it with a different word. But um, yeah, you can kind of ask yourself those questions about every character, like who are they, da 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 da. And if you can't answer those, then you'll actually have a plot. You'll have conflict. Here's here's a curveball for you, uh, Gary. Ooh. When you have a "what do they want" question, what if they don't know what they want and what they need? Someone else is trying to provide that's not the main character. I guess so. Instead of what do they want, it's what do they need. So in order to grow, they might. They might kind of want something, but not be invested in it. And then you might have like a romantic interest being like, look, this person is kind of in a bad place and they need this. And they might not know that they need this. But if you're telling it from the main character's perspective, you're, you're basically trying to foreshadow or show that they need something and then mm -hmm. have another character show that they're trying to help. Um, but at the same time, it's what they want, they might not know what they want. I mean, I see this a lot of time in real life where people, they're in a place and they're not quite happy, but they don't know what they want to do about it. Well, they should still have a want. That would be different than that, because if they don't have a want on their own, then they're a pretty bland and flat character. But what you basically mm -hmm. asked me is the do they get it answer, and it could be no, they don't get what they want, but they actually get what they need instead. Mm -hmm. And one comment... Sorry, Brony Wright, were you going to say something? Hmm? No, no, it sounds like... No. I was just like, the one comment I was going to make to that is the thing is, I feel like these an the answers to these questions can be changed by the plot. Mm -hmm. And that is itself leads some can be something that leads to interesting character development. 
when that's it's kind of like melodrama. What they want at the start isn't what they want at the end, or how they're going to go about to get it is not what they did it. Or by the fact of the matter, it's like, oh, I wanted this, but because I didn't get it, now I want that. It's like, I wanted to win the lottery, but because sat, sad sack over there got the lottery ticket before me, I'm going to go kill him. And it's it should also be noted that people can want to know what their want is. You see that more in coming of age and self-discovery. It's They're searching, but they don't know what they're searching for. Did you want to say something, Bernie Ryder? Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I think, uh, I think it was Penstroke who said, uh, in a panel we did, gosh, a long time ago, every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. It's a Kurt Vonnegut quote, I think, or something like that. Yep. Uh, I am, I'm honored you're thinking I said that, but I don't remember saying that. That may have been Silver Quill or someone else at Everfree Northwest. It was the cat speaking through you, well, Penstroke. Well, it was during a, uh, uh, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, the, the quote still applies. Uh, every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. I mean, like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, imagine a story of, like, Twilight Sparkle woke up, decided she was already content in bed, then went back to sleep the end. <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> that's just yeah, boring. That's a story. Um, but if uh, Twilight, but uh, if... Twilight Sparkles woke up, decided she was already content in bed, and then, boom, the Fire Nation attacked with Terminators, and they got her out of bed, and she wanted to go back to bed. That makes for a little bit more interesting story, because she wants to go back to bed, but the Fire Nation Terminators are keeping her from bed. Uh, we want to see how Twilight Sparkle fights Fire Nation Terminators. Even a glass of water is interesting. Look what happened when Discord wanted a glass of water. <laughs> I was thinking of that exact song. And... That brings up a really good point, is that you can have different wants and needs. You see it a lot for epics. Um, I think you see it a little bit in Past Sins, therefore Penstroke is considered the authority in this, but um, I remember seeing it a lot in um, Fallout Equestria, where the character needs to get something done, and they put their wants aside, but the fact that they're thirsty or that they're injured or that their friends in danger and they need to get this other thing done helps add tension. It helps build towards the climax. And so by having even more than just one primary want, it can really, really help the feel of a story and make it feel more fleshed out because you have a sense that in the world, this is very important. Well, Twilight might just be getting a glass of water but or trying to get a nap. But, or what was it? It was the, in the ticket to, the ticket episode. It was like the third episode of lunch. Ponies. Yeah. She wanted lunch. <laughs> she wanted yeah. lunch. Yeah. And it kept getting put off and put off and put off and interrupted. And rather than just being interrupted once where it doesn't matter, like the fifth time that repetition started adding more meaning to itself. And it really helped add a lot to the, uh, feel of the episode and it, you also get to explore how the character handles stress so it helps you flush out characters by using the plot device i also find it interesting when um a character's wants uh start becoming oh gosh how, how do i put this like uh i don't know if hazardous is the right word to other characters and especially themselves. Yep. So like in my serial killer rarity story, the secret life of rarity, she kills because it's like a heroin fix to her. But as we all know, murder is completely wrong. And especially when, you know, other ponies around her, like, you know, twilight and Applejack and especially sweetie bell start getting hurt by what she's doing. Uh, then that adds me i think tension because she needs to she's also she feels she's doing it to protect them but she's also kind of not she she, she really wants her fix if you will mm -hmm. uh so her wants are getting in the are conflicting she wants two different things she wants to protect her sister and her friends by killing but by satisfying the other want of getting her fix her two wants are 
yeah. tearing her life apart. You, you um, see it a lot in dark stories where, and, uh, especially if someone has maybe a consumption problems with a different type of drug or even sugar or caffeine, I've seen it used, um, where they sometimes even they want to not want something. And mm-hmm. so the different wants competing with each other helps build tension as well. Yeah, I mean, Rarity doesn't want to be a serial bounce. killer, but she totally does. Captain Crunch made her mad one day, and that was it. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But, exactly. Um, <laughs> but um, it's like, we can actually loop this back to a reference um, Pi made earlier with Fallout Equestria. One of the, it's like, for spoiler alert, eeny, eeny, um, one of the big subplots is the main characters dealing with the fact that um, they got hooked on a drug that, at when used, helped them get and complete situations that needed them to be at the top of their game, but is leaving them on a on a low end when it's done. Mm-hmm. And um, we had a, a question from Fifth Rider again, um, and it says, as, "As life has often often has more than one story happening, as writers, a good or bad idea to write more than one plot in a single story." Um, I know Gary has something he wants to say on this as well, but I. Um, one of the things I would say is that a lot of it depends on your skill level and some plots work better than others. I absolutely love romance as a side plot for any story. I think it can add a lot because it shows that the character is more than just this one, um, directional towards the end of the story. It means they have things el- or more things that they want. And you can have some romances that are very in the moment, yeah, you see that a lot with um, movies or like a single episode for a TV show. But with a story, a lot of times you want to leave it with it's more than just in the moment. It's not just because they're stressed or because they might die. It's that they honestly have something that the other person's looking for. Going back to that, what do they want? And um, so some plots work better together. But if you're starting out as an author, stick to shorter stories. I there's a lot of writers out there myself included, who will start off with these grand ideas and then um, it doesn't work out. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, it gets that too all much the time. To track of. So, Still do that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, I mean, major writers, I mean, George R. R. Martin and a bunch of other writers that I'm a fan of, and I'm terrible with names, so I can't remember them right now, they started off writing short stories. And so after they become popular, then they'll really say, hey, I got started by writing these short stories. There's a little compendium book that's, you know, about the size of my normal story, and it's just shorts. And you'll see a lot of where the main where their main story that they're popular for kind of got its start. It's that there's these little uh, side stories that they happen to really like, and then they built on that in a main story. So if you're new... Start simpler. As you get more experienced, you'll figure out which plots work better together. And now I'm going to kick you over to Gary, who I've been making sure doesn't get a word in edgewise. Isn't that right, Gary? Oh, it's, no, it's fine, man. Uh, to kind of allude to what you just said there or kind of bounce off that, I made the mistake of writing one long thing first, and it was really, really brutal. I learned a lot, and I actually finished it, revised all that stuff, but it's so painful. But once it's in your head, it can't get out until you finish it. But what I was, I was going to say, yeah, writing a novel is your first thing. Oh, please. I anyway, uh, third. yeah, what I was going to say is um, sitcoms, like, you know, television show sitcoms are actually, they always consist of three plots, almost always, I think. Yep. Uh, one, there's two main plots that are going on at the same time. And there's also like a third tertiary plot. And that kind of answers the question on multiple plots. It, like TV does it all the time, just... Watch a sitcom with a writer's eye, and you'll just be like, oh, yeah, there's plot A, plot B, and then the minor plot. And they all kind of intertwine and get res- resolved at the end. So it takes a lot of skill to do that, as Pico said. Some really short stories only need the one plot, and you want to start weaving more in when you get better and when you're writing a story that actually demands more plots. There's no real limit. And you, I'm, doing, I'm actually going through Frasier right now. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen. I'm, I'm doing that with Frasier right now, and... Um, I will say that I don't know about other store, other shows, but I've really gotten more into um, Pony, the My Little Pony show. So mm-hmm. you'll have like one director who keeps track of all the stories. And if you listen to different interviews that people give, 
Um, they'll talk about uh, how like they'll they'll have a meeting now at the beginning of the season. They'll come up with some plot ideas and they'll have a major arc or two that they're that they're going for. And then they'll have individual stories and they'll try and figure out who can write which story the best. And some pe- times they'll people will come up with ideas and then other people will latch on to them more, which helps from you know a series perspective that where things aren't always um, continuously connected, where you have each individual episode um, being a little bit different. And mm-hmm. like, uh, we've, seen, we've seen that a bit with Equestria Games and the guy. Yeah. Uh, Let's uh, not talk about Equestria Games. I like the Equestria Games. I like it as a Spike episode. I no, the, the only good Spike episode in the entire series was Inspiration Manifestation. They, mm-hmm. The rest of them have just... Sucked. Part of the problem with it is they actually did too much foreshadowing, and it was very broad foreshadowing. There's the Equestria games, like, well, the CMC are involved. Well, Rainbow Dash is involved. Well, Rainbow Dash, I mean, the Wonder Bolts are going to be there. It's going to be this big thing, and then we see none of it. There's too much foreshadowing that's and not... And it's a spike episode, and there's and they didn't follow up on any of the foreshadowing that they did. We're still yeah. talking about foreshadowing, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> we told you oh, we told you that we'd foreshadow Uh-oh. talk about more foreshadowing. <laughs> it's a reliable narrator. Hmm. Surprise! <laughs> oh, it's, a self, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. What you were talking about, though, Pico, is kind of the writer's room environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know for stories, it, it always helps uh, character development. Um, sorry to talk over you, but uh, it helps the, the different stories that are kind of repeating plot points seem different because you have um, someone at the lead making sure that, as, that each story is a progression that it's not a repeat of an earlier episode that you know they might get something and then send it back because they're like this actually looks a lot like this story um so here's this script so that you can read it since yours is coming later in the season so that it it's not the same but um to round back to the thought of plot and whatnot and how many to have it's like Generally, it's also a general gauge of how many plots you can fit in and for different skill, skill levels is the shorter the story you're sh- shooting for, the higher the skill level you need to work in multiple plots. If it's going to be a single one-shot chapter, more often than not, you're going to maybe get one core plot and then maybe one subplot within it at, at mm. most intermediate levels. It's like the sitcom writing or like the multiple perspective writing is like, it's just, just like the fact is like you start running out of space to mention all these different plots if you're without expanding into larger territory. Mm-hmm. Although I've conversely found um, that you can shove more plots in there when you have a <clears throat> vignette style story, uh, which is what I'd classify my story TD the Alicorn Princess as, is a it's just a long story it's 150,000 words so far and it's just made up of a bunch of vignettes it's stuffed in there to make a bunch to make a overarching story um about his reign as the third uh princess of equestria would would calling it somewhat episodic almost be another way to describe it i know it's that yeah. not exactly right but I, I would also call it that. Yeah, that, that that would fit as well. And like like the show or other TV shows, um, I have taken elements from past arcs, episodes, whatever you want to call them, and use them in, in, in other ones, or I'll be using ones from the past in future arcs. Um, so I guess if you have a really long story, you can put in multiple plots like that because you have, I guess, a lot of room to juggle all of them. And, uh, I guess you can just have as many as you want. And, and something I'd like to add here, since we're talking about series that keep going and something I've noticed with My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, some of the plots are, are kind of similar. You have these epic like equestria threatening events so you start with nightmare moon and then you have discord and sombra and the changelings and the new villain and there is a problem with it in that each time you're basically trying especially with things that are a little bit more epic or that are supposed to have a lot of tension 
is that you tend to try to constantly outdo the previous things you've done. And if you're not making it its own story, if you're not having it be its own thing, including side plots, especially it helps with side plots. Side plots are different. Um, but you compare things. Like I'll always compare everything after uh, the two-part Changelings Invade Equestrian Interrupt the Wedding episode. It I'll com- I mean I'll I'll compare everything to that and the problem is is that that was really good and nothing else really stacks up quite as much to that to those two episodes and so now you keep getting like well uh, uh, Twilight's now an alicorn and oh god now uh uh now now she's a better alicorn and she's got a crystal castle because we've had the crystal empire so now we have to have m- more crystal things to to be more and to oh, be more epic and more rainbows <laughs> we have to have more rain like it, uh, it, in it fairness feels cluttered I, in fairness i think hasbro had yes. input on the rainbows yep but Hasbro's and not the right, castle. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, no, I. We need to be in the new Hasbro. That is what we call <laughs> jumping the shark. When when you create an event that you just absolutely cannot top in a series, that's when you've jumped the shark, and that's a lot of the time when it goes downhill because you can't go up from there. You just start going down, and then you turn into the Simpsons. Yeah, but if you make it its own thing, you can have episodes that aren't as epic, but still feel like they have a. Mm-hmm. A, a, a space for it. I mean, you kind of see this in... I, I've seen a... There's a one fantasy novel series I can't remember the name of, um, but basically it, it becomes more epic and more epic and more epic, and then a character gets put in this situation where they don't have their friends, where, where they're outnumbered, where, where they've put themselves in a bad place, and then they die. And so while they've done epic things, they were always prepared for it. And now that they aren't prepared, now it's too much for them and they sacrifice themselves to save their friends. So if you, I actually want to say, if you write everything perfectly, then you're going to stunt yourself and you're going to stunt how your fans view your writing because you'll, you'll never quite be at the same level. But if you control the flaws in your writing and you make it so that certain things can be better, but it's still acceptable as it is, you can, you can have more combinations so you can have, you know, a perfect romance and then you can have an okay romance that's maybe more of a drama because the characters don't quite interact and maybe it doesn't end as well. And it also keeps your readers thinking kind of what Brony Rider was saying with people keep predicting uh, how his stories are going and then they don't necessarily turn out the same. If you're changing up how you're doing things and you don't do it absolutely, absolutely perfect and epic every time, then it's good. I mean, think of Shakespeare. He does, did a lot of different plays. They might have similar themes, but mm-hmm. in how he does them, it's very different. And he breaks, and once you get good, you can start breaking the rules in very specific ways. In Romeo and Juliet, he says that, I, I believe I'm thinking about this correctly, uh, and Gary will be able to correct me if I'm not, but he will say, this is what's going to happen. And then it happens. And you're not supposed to outright say what's going to happen. I mean, it's supposed to ruin it, but it works for that type of story and how he did it. And you kind of forget because it's kind of out of place compared to the rest of the story. So you get what Penstroke was saying where it's even past foreshadowing, you have it and then people forget about it and then it happens. It's it's not the destination, it's the journey. Yes. I guess is what you're saying. It's like all of Shakespeare's plays, spoiler alert, if their name is in the title, they're going to die. (laughs) <laughs> and generally in Act 5 <laughs> so um, I liked Titus uh, so we have uh, Murney asking how, how to end your plot um, well, to me basically once your character gets what they want or they realize they can't get what they want or you know yeah. die or something like that once they've come to a conclusion about what they want, essentially, because by that point, that's it. You have nothing else to write. <laughs> Anything else is just drawing it out. Yeah, and sometimes obscure endings are good. Like, you know, in Inception, does the top keep spinning? 
we don't know, but that's still a good ending. And uh, one challenge I want to pose to you guys is this is one of what one of my professors said in a uh, short fiction class. Class, he said, "Don't marry or kill your protagonist at the end. Don't do it." Yeah, then you just have to bring them back, and then now it's just, no. Um, Too late. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done that. I, I I have I have I have abided by the the advice. I don't think I've killed or married anyone. Oh, I've killed alert, so Nightmare many Nightmare of the show's dead. characters. I have <laughs> killed Nightmare. so many of the show's characters. It's not even funny. Me too. But I think I I'm think not even talking about the one where I destroyed I, the whole universe. I'm talking like separate instances. Oh. Well, I'm not a murderer, so I have that on you guys. Um, so one you're thing not a writer or a murderer. Well, I mean, you're murdering your characters. You're a bad person. No, it's. I'm actually perfectly fine with uh, people with writers killing off their characters. Um, I think that you look at a lot of the older stories that that not even just be, that people grew up on, but that developed into the stories and plots that we have nowadays. You have a lot more realistic, like bad things can happen. I mean, that's one of the things about Game of Thrones is that good characters die, bad characters die too, but it helps add tension. Also, if your readers aren't, if you're writing for a more mature audience and the reader can't handle a character that they're invested in dying, you're giving them growth. They might decide that you're, the ending to your story is not very good, but you're still helping them learn to be a better person and deal with stuff. I mean, I see it a lot where something bad happens and people nowadays, they don't know how to deal with it, but you know, people always get the their the girl. The guy always gets the girl now, or the girl always gets the guy, and people always end you know happily ever after. And I, I like hate leaving, those endings. Yeah, no. and I like leaving. <laughs> I hate them. I like leaving Hollywood. plots a little bit more open. Like there's questions that need to be answered, but I like to leave them like that so that the reader can kind of fill it in themselves or can think about it. It leaves them with more than just a smile on the face and they go on. Mm -hmm. It leaves them with questions. It leaves them with feelings. It leaves them with emotion. Um, and so dealing with the main purpose of, a, of the story, the main plot is good, but it's always good to leave um, a partial ending for other plots. Like you might have a romance. It's like, look, we've been dealing with this and we haven't been able to spend time together, but I'm willing to give it a try. If you are, it's like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm good with that too. And yep. you know, you have the kiss and then it ends. Well, do they get married? Do they live happily ever after? It's like, there's some questions, but you also know that they're giving it a try. And that's a very human condition that people can relate to. Mm -hmm. And um, all this talk of endings actually brings up a one question that just another time Lord asked. Hi, time Lord. He, he one of my pre-readers. Nice to see him. Oh, um, he <laughs> is. Is he, I thought he was here because of me. Yep. But um, Lord. um, it's like he was saying, it's like he wanted to ask a question about happy endings. Like, as he sees it, he would rather not have happy endings in his stories because he finds them unrealistic. But just like what our opinions are of them, of them are. And if I can lead on this, it's like my opinion on happy endings is, is like, let the, it's like, I don't. It's like personally, I end up writing a lot of happy endings, but that must be just because what I like. But I don't go in focusing on that. It's like if you say, oh, I'm going to have a bad ending on the story, then while well, you're kind of writing it, you're kind of putting yourself into a corner with that before you even start. And it's like if, if the plot line resolves in one way, it's like, oh, it's going to be a bad ending just because that's what makes the most sense. And I guess good or bad, you should give the ending that will not leave readers going, what the heck? In a bad, I should say. To kind of go off sort of what you guys are saying, I wasn't saying that you can't kill off your characters. I mean, like, in one of my stories, I, like, blew up Cloudsdale and did a bunch of other stupid stuff. But uh, it's just, what does your story want to be? You've got to get an idea of what your story wants to be. And the reason why I said the challenge is to not murder or kill your character or murder or marry your characters is because that's a very easy way to end a story, and it tries to make you think of the right way to end the story based on the situation. And uh, one technique a lot of people advocate when writing a book is think of the ending first. And then once you've got the ending, you're like, okay, I know where I want this to end up. How do I get there? And then you sort of go by yeah. the seat of your pants. If it changes, 
partway through the journey, that's fine too. That's what rewrites are for. You have infinite <laughs> shots at the goal. I, I can actually counter that. So in the show Frasier, spoiler alert, um, you have the main character, which for like five or for the majority of the seasons is obviously the main character. Towards the end, his brother gets married. And he gets married to someone that he's literally been going after that he's literally been in love with since he first saw her seven seasons ago. And you you know, you have the repeat jokes and the tropes that it makes, but then you also have they end up together. But they don't just end up together. There's like a season or more of them dating to make sure that they're right for each other. And then they get married and then it still goes on. And by this point, not uh, the brother Niles has basically become the main character of the show. But even though he gets married, it still manages to continue. So if you want to see a a more highbrow uh, series that manages to keep evolving how they're writing the story Frazier's really good about that and they manage and part of it is kind of that they keep can keep focusing on different characters but it's still it it it's well done and I don't I'm re-watching it now it's been years so I can't really say why until I catch up yeah it kind of actually augments my point doesn't counter it's like what's right based on the situation and that's like an instinct you've kind of that's have to true. develop as a writer it takes yeah. time I still scat it, so I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't write happy. I tend not to write happy endings, um, and that's not. Um, it's not necessarily because I hate them, although they're not my favoriteest endings. Um, I tend to end my stories the only way that I can. Uh, so the secret life of Rarity doesn't end with her being cured of her desires to be a psychotic murderer. It ends the only way it can. Uh, not happy. I don't shoehorn in a happy ending. Well, and even some good. of my happier... No, yeah, no. I, <laughs> and even some of like my happier stories, like my comedies, I don't like... You don't force it. I don't force it. I mean, I guess I end like some of my comedies with like a smile on your face. Like, okay, that's funny. But I wouldn't call it like a happy ending. Well, I guess it all depends on your definition of a yeah, happy exactly. ending. Like the characters are better off than they were before. And you can have endings that are happy in some ways and sad in others. So you might have this epic romance as a side plot to an epic story. And it ends with the character dying, but maybe he dies specifically to save the girl. Or the other way around, the girl gives her life to save him so he can go on to save the world. It's a sad ending. It's it's beautiful. And in the context, there's a lot of meaning to it. And mm-hmm. so it helps build up the resolution of the climax. Because now now this, you ruined the side plot. You ruined the romance side plot. Like, you better go get that evil villain. And you can have partially happy endings and those in my opinion tend to be the best um i remember totally not a brony did a story um about vampire cheerlead you know cheerlead gets turned into a vampire and it ends with oh i love those stories yeah she she's not cured but she's okay with the situation which given the context of she was just turned into a vampire and is finding her place in the world now it's a happy ending but it's not like oh and sunshine and rainbows um, but it, in the context, it has meaning. Context matters a lot more. Than uh, some, uh, Cheryoshi Ban, who I'm sorry I mispronounced your name, um, asks, and this will probably be our last question. Um, he asks, okay, so I don't know if this fits completely with the theme of plot, but how do you work with mental processes for someone who is crazy or sleep deprived to panic? Um, it's My, like, do we do we want to shift gears and kind of do a prelude for our characterization panel next yes. month? Yes, I I was thinking of doing that and and you beat me to it. Darn you. <laughs> it's, it's 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 the experience with that cat that leads you to be predictive. Um, so yeah, our next uh, panel next our panel last precon panel next month will be on character, and so this works well into that. Um. My my degree is actually in psychology, so I'm going to end this and I'm going to let probably 
brony writer start this off since he seems to be dealing with that and then uh <laughs> Gary, what do you mean? Like, stroke. that's my expertise? Like, well, my area of expertise? You've, you've because it is. about a, a serial killer rarity a couple of times, so I figured that's a good yeah. thing. Uh, well, I've. So, I mean, let me see if I understand the question completely. Let me read this. Uh, so, how do I work with the mental process of someone who is crazy or sleep deprived or panicked? So, like, how do you work with a character who's not all there, who's crazy kind of thing? I, I, think. I think illogical would be a good word for it. Characters that don't make decisions that are necessarily in their self-interest or necessarily even towards their ultimate goal. Okay. And how um, that, and you can work that in with how it affects the plot as well. Okay. Uh, I think the best way to do it is... Um, hmm. See, especially the Secret Life of Rarity is written from Rarity's perspective... So, um, the way I did it is I had her actions make sense to her. Um, she didn't just go, okay, I'm going to do this evil thing. She's like, okay, I'm going to kill Trixie because, you know, she humiliated me and my friends, um, during the episode, during season one, episode eight. <laughs> it, it follows false canon it, it kind of sounds like excuses in in rarity's case because she kind of has this oh, desire that she's trying to re trying to repress and then the show dexter as well where oh yeah the, the character is like I, I i don't want you i don't want you it's like that person that person just made themselves a target because i don't know they they shortchanged me or, or they cut me off in traffic or something yeah, no, I mean, it's it's totally excuses, but again, they make sense to her. So she works so that it, I guess I kind of have it so that I try to balance out making sense to her with making sense to the readers as well. So in making sense to her, I show the readers, oh, okay, yeah, she's nuts, yeah, she's being irrational, yeah, she's evil, or whatever. But, from her perspective, I can see why she would do something like that. Uh, I can see the path that led her to go down that road, uh, make that decision, uh, something like that. So, does that make sense? Like, y y you gotta have their actions makes sense on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it is a twisted sense. Even yeah. if it's a twisted sense. Um, because if you just have a character... And this is why I think a lot of people write Pinkie Pie so horribly. Um, if you just have a character who's like, oh, I'm just going to have this character do yeah. this crazy thing just for this. Well, at that point, the character is not a character. That character is a tool. Yeah. It's just like, like Pinkie, a... Pinkie and you even Pie see does... that in the show a lot. It's like, oh, yeah, I know. The writers are horrible about that. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes they knock Pinkie Pie out of the park, and mm -hmm. it's amazing. I, I like it when she leads them to the plot or to, to the resolution, and you think, like, oh, Pinky, like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, this kind of, like, led to the thing. Does Pinky know something about what's going on? Like, is she more aware of the situation? And it makes Paris the character Bryce. kind of mysterious. It, a, perfect, a perfect example of that is the whole Paris Sprite. Yeah, the Paris Sprite. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like we just think she's being crazy and grabbing weird things, but or that's what our friends would think. But in the, it's like it's for a purpose. She she knows darn well what she's doing. I mean, yeah, yeah she could have taken four seconds to say, "Hey, Twilight, instruments will beat the Paris sprites." But at the same time, you know, cinematically, I can understand why they did it that way. But mm -hmm. so at the same time, so yeah, basically, you have to have the character's actions make sense to the character, and you have to hint to the readers why they're doing that so that to the readers they can kind of put themselves in the shoes of the characters a little bit and go okay yeah the characters what they're what they're doing is wrong it's crazy but from their perspective i can kind of understand it a little bit um to comment on it, it's like the question was also for sleep deprived and panicked it's like it's like there's one brand of crazy where someone is defending what they're doing and all this stuff. And it's like it's it's like it makes logic in their head, 
and that's why they're doing what they're doing. Another variety can be the simple fact of their mind can't stay on a particular track. This probably leans more towards um, leans more towards like being sleep deprived. Is you know, it's like the character is thinking about this and doing this, and like in a tangent, and they go off on that tangent, and then they can't realize. Wait, what was I doing? Or um, I actually explored or did a scene for crazy, and I don't think this chapter's come out for, from the depths yet, but. It's like where you're, the narrator is kind of speaking to the thoughts of the character, and it's just like it's contradictory. When thoughts in a in a character's own head don't seem to line up, that really can sell crazy. How about you uh, start the uh, wrap it up? Uh, we'll wrap it up with Gary Oak. Sure. Uh, a lot of what Brony Writer said was what I was going to say. Everything has to make sense to the person. Like, that's one way to actually write a villain as well, is have all of their motives make complete sense and seem good to them, because almost no one sees themselves as evil or crazy or what have you. And for, I guess, mental instability, um, probably one of the best things you can do is actual research. Like, someone lost someone close to them. How does that affect them? talk to people who have or talk to people who've dealt with stuff like this how does it affect their mental process and have that you know put a spin on their logic and have them i guess have things still make sense to them but make sure to have those effects you know i guess take effect in there sorry if that was kind of lame but uh brony writer brony writer kind of stole my thunder there uh, happens yeah uh, i guess with four people talking it's gonna happen yeah, yeah, no. It's four people talking about the same topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm going to uh, finish that question off with is the more different from you you're making the character, the more of a psychological profile you have to write for the character because n nothing's worse than you have Twilight Sparkle and then you're you're writing yourself in her place on accident. And you see it a lot, especially in fan fiction and early works for authors is a lot of the characters will seem kind of similar and you can't put your finger on it. And what it is, is the uh, author themselves would be acting a certain way and they're kind of mixing the characters with themselves or they're getting characters crossed. Um, it's kind of easy to have multiple characters that are different from each other. And that's one of the reasons why My Little Pony is so has such good characters is because a lot of them are different um, in drastic ways. But for people and characters who are mentally unstable, um, you have to construct reasons why they have stuff. Um, you have to uh, write a different pattern of logic for yourself for them. And the actions that they take, um, especially if they're like losing their sanity, if they're, if they're falling deeper down the well or they're spiraling out of control. I mean, the reason why it's called the spiral is because it keeps going and it, and it can, and it can get bigger or it can get tighter. Like they can become more crazy and uncontrollable and in the moment in general, or they can become very focused on one thing. They can become very OCD about something. Um, is a good example. Clock is ticking. Twilight clock is ticking. <laughs> yeah, that that is a very good example. Um, where Twilight, you know, it's getting closer and closer to the deadline for the letters. She, she becomes more and more and more focused on it to the point where she's not paying attention like, to her own moral code. That's a very good example. Thank you, Bernie Writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, look at Avatar: The Last Airbender, season three. It really yes. goes into the motives of like the crazy or the bad characters, quote unquote, and it really adds that extra layer of humanity to it that makes it all really just come together and have a really powerful conclusion. And, and reading too much into things is really, is a really good thing um, where someone does something wrong. And so now it's like, are, are you trying, trying to hurt me? Like, I can't trust you. You're fired. Um, things like that, where um, people's reality gets distorted where what what they're what they're seeing is not what they're understanding um so i think that will wrap it up for this everfree northwest pre-con panel on uh, plot um we like to wind things down with uh, one cool thing from each of uh, from me and each of the uh, other guests so i would like to direct people's attention to wikipedia because if you're stuck on something you don't know where to work something out you need inspiration for a setting or for characters wikipedia i mean wikipedia is one of the most visited sites in the world for a reason um and i won't rely 
I'm really bad at remembering names of things like plot devices. We have a little master document here with them, a bunch of them written down, for instance. So Wikipedia is a great resource for any aspect of writing. Um, and if you want to go into a different world, maybe you started with writing fan fiction. Maybe you want to become a screenwriter, like I believe Gary Oak has some inkling to do. Uh, you can look up different things before you're invested in it. And Wikipedia is really good for that. And uh, pen strokes. One cool thing. My one cool thing is a website called Seventh Sanctum, which is a random generator site just full of just random generators for names, places, settings, plots, ide story ide generators. It's like it's just throwing words together with Mad Libs and whatnot, but that thing can be kind of just the thing that gets your gears turning. It's like you click through a few things, it's like, oh, it's like that, 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 and then they die. Oh, ideas. But like they have a, probably a hundred different kinds of generators on that website, if not somewhere in that ballpark. Cool. And Brony Writer, what is your one cool thing? Well, uh, it's not a website, and I guess it's going to come across as a little big-headed now that you were both linked to websites. I wasn't when you said one cool thing that was so vague. I wasn't like, uh. it's supposed to be vague. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is but, an evil. Especially when you started if with you Wikipedia. You just found I was bananas, like... and they're the greatest thing. It is perfectly <laughs> okay to share what you want about bananas. Be, be forewarned, we might send you to the moon. Yes. Quite. Anywho, uh, I am in the process of getting uh, my story, The Secret Life of Rarity, which I know I've talked about a lot, but I mean, it's I think it's my best one, so it's what I have to draw the most off of. I'm in the process of working on it and getting it published into a hard copy novel so that Penstroke won't have Monopoly on that. <laughs> I don't have Monopoly on it now. What are you talking about, fool? <laughs> no, I'm not I'm making a joke. I know, yeah, I know we got you Fallout own Equestrian. You Place, and we all know it. <laughs> I know we got Fallout Monopoly Equestrian, Flight of the Alicorn, and Pass Sin, so I'd like to add Secret Life of Rarity to the list of published brony novels. And we've got a long way to go before that's even remotely ready for that kind of thing, so I'm still looking for... No, it's, Pre it's always readers. <laughs> no, it's always interesting to classify it because it's like Fallout and Past Sins, they were taken by other people where Flight of the Pegasus was done by the author, him or herself. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll have to talk to Prandor Prancy Pants about that. I go, how'd you do it? But it's still, I have to get it to good enough mm. where it's even remotely... Because, I mean, it was my third story, and I had no idea what the heck I was doing. So, And that shows! <laughs> so I guess that's my cool thing, is I'm trying to make that into a published hard copy book. And then Gary. Yeah, uh, for brony books, does it count if it's a book written by a brony? Because that's what I'm trying to do with my non-pony thing. <laughs> anyway, no. <laughs> The cool thing that I wanted to link was that uh, script, that Google Docs script. It should be for public viewing. It's the current final draft of my two-part MLP spec script that I wrote for fourth-year dramatic writing course. It needs to be revised to work for, with the season four finale in mind, but uh, it's basically uh, professional-looking, and it's meant to work as a script for the series. So I had to stick exactly to the canon, what would work, and all that stuff. And I guess it's the the height of my achievement, I guess, when it comes to screenwriting things. Not too many people in this fandom seem to really know about scripts or write scripts, so I felt it was kind of a cool thing I could link since There's, it's a bit um, different. It's, yeah, no, scripts, it's like uh, Drew Flashy, he goes by, is big in the script writing, and it's like I've actually mm -hmm. been on a panel with him at, at the convention that shall not be named that happened in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> the on there, it's like we actually Ooh, have it's like uh, we have a discussion of why um, scripts Con. tend to be kind of lean less. And it's just because they are much more a component of a larger thing. Scripts are meant to be performed on stage or mm -hmm. turned into animated videos or stuff like that. It's like they're not meant to stand alone, really. They're meant to be part of a whole. Precisely. And 
I, one of the reasons why I was compelled to write episode scripts is like, you know, the writing for Double Rain Boom and Snowdrop and Button Mash is like, yeah. you, okay, you've got all these really talented people working on it. You've got talented animators, talented voice actors, all this stuff, but you couldn't even get a real writer? Why? It, it just mm. really hurt me inside. The, the problem is, and I see this even in fan fiction, is a lot of people don't consider writing to be like a serious art it's like well anyone can write it's like well yes but no. that's like saying anyone can paint but anyone that doesn't draw. mean that they're doing it good yeah i can draw stick figures they won't look like what i'm drawing but i can draw them i can't even draw a circle but i can still draw like yeah same thing so uh i'd like to thank everyone once again for joining us shush all tap uh, thank everyone once again for joining us. Everfree Northwest strives to do its best to give back to this wonderful community and especially for fan fiction. If you're interested in our convention um, over the July 4th weekend, you can find out more at everfreenorthwest.com. Our last panel character will take place sometime next month. I'm hoping uh, for this weekend of the 7th and the 8th, but we will have to see. Um, you can keep up with us by liking us on Facebook, following us on Tumblr, and Twitter, and of course, we have a Fim Fiction account and a Fim Fiction group. Um, so I would like to thank all of our guests for coming on and give them a chance to say their goodbyes. And well, I know, I know you like this so panel. Hard. Uh, thanks for having me. It's like this is my second one, and I'm also signed up for the third one because of backroom dealings with uh, with Mr. Pi. Hey, I, I need to get all the copies of the book. All the copies of past sins. I will be a millionaire in millions of words. But um, it's like, thanks again for having me. I, I think we have really had a good discussion today. I think this went much better than the first one since we did have an outline. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I hope to see you at Character. And then maybe even at Everfree Northwest, where the reason we're doing these is to get these out of the way so we can do other funner panels. Yay. So long, every pony. Later, guys. TTFN. Rock out! <laughs> I wanted to say an outro, but I don't get to. Ah.